Shalom, and welcome to another edition here on the Genesis 49 page, where we say no to vague interpretation and we give thorough breakdowns. Shalom, and welcome to another edition here on the Genesis 49ers page, where we say no to vague interpretations and we give thorough breakdowns. Today's topic is early Christianity, a different Christianity, because a lot of our people have been led to believe that the Christianity that this world pushes on our youth and on us as a child, and that has been forced down our throat in the secular community, is the true Christianity. But within this presentation, I'm going to show and prove that Christianity has changed. And the Christianity that people follow now is a different Christianity than the ancient original Christianity. Because you have groups that are claiming that what, what we call Christianity today is the true Christianity. For example, people that, that go with tropes like this. Saying that the law is done away with, that is, is, is universal, there's no hierarchy. That's not what the Bible pushes. That's not what Christianity was about. There was still a hierarchical system. The Israelites were still on top. Okay? And the laws, statutes, and commandments were still in effect. So we're going to show and prove that today with this presentation. Early Christianity, a different Christianity. Now, first slide. The Sabbath, because a lot of proponents of modern Christianity neglects the Sabbath. They don't follow the text at all because Christ kept the Sabbath. The apostles kept the Sabbath. So why don't they keep the Sabbath? Because they have created a doctrine that changed during the first and second century AD. And that's where most of my source is going to come from. When people started pushing Sunday and after the third century AD, when Constantine got involved, involved with Christianity, that's when everything went left. Everything got blown out of proportion. And we're going to get into that later in the presentation. And we're going to discuss these things because it's important. Because modern Christianity, proponents of modern Christianity does not push the Sabbath. They don't keep the Sabbath. But when we look into early Christianity and the records, they kept the Sabbath. We have the records right here. The seventh book of the Apostle Constitution, chapter 25. And it states, but keep the Sabbath. Wait a minute, hold up. Let me read that again. This is early Christian literature from the second century AD. It says, but keep the Sabbath and the Lord's Day's festival, which is Passover. Right? Because the former is the memorial of creation and the latter of the resurrection. Right? So, seventh book of the Apostle, the Apostle Constitution, chapter 25. This is not debatable. Early Christianity, they were proponents. Early Christians were proponents of the Sabbath day. They kept and reverenced the Sabbath day. So, why does modern Christianity, why does proponents of modern Christianity, why don't they keep the Sabbath? Because they're not keeping the original Christianity. You guys are attacking Israelites for going back to the law, statutes, and commandments and saying, oh, that's unchristian. That's not Christian. You guys are not Christian. But the original Christians kept the Sabbath. And they wrote it down in their archives and in their books and in their instructions for their followers to keep the Sabbath. Next slide, the Didache. Now, I remember first hearing this Didache. It was during the debate between James White and an elder rock from uh, from GOCC. And during this debate, he said he brought up the Didache, which is the early teaching of the 12 apostles. That's the name that's attributed to it. But what he failed to mention, because he's away from, he doesn't want to keep the commandments. He, he's a proponent of Christmas, which is nowhere in the Bible or nowhere in the biblical text. It's an amalgamation of paganism and, and biblical tropes. But he failed to mention that the Didache mentions, Thou shalt not forsake the commandments of the Lord. In chapter 4, 
verse 13, it clearly states, Thou shalt not forsake the commandments of the Lord. So why are these, these Christians, especially when they go to seminary school, not bringing this up? Why are they not reading chapter 4, verse 13, and teaching this to the congregation and to their schools and their colleges? Why is this not a debate piece? Because these people are masters of omission. Shout out to my brother James Cassell, because that brother bring that word up and that term up all the time. And it's true. Masters of omission. You, you omit everything you don't like about the biblical text and the apostolic literature. Okay? You omit everything to keep the tradition of modern Christianity going. The, the tradition of Constantine's Christianity going. Because you're not following Peter's Christianity. You're not following John the, James the Just Christianity. John the Revelator's Christianity. Paul Christianity. You're following Constantine's Christianity. Because you damn sure are fake forsaking the commandments of the Lord. The scripture says, thou shalt not forsake the commandments of the Lord. That's what the Didache says. The teaching of the 12 apostles says in chapter 4, verse 13, thou shalt not forsake the commandments of the Lord, but thou shalt keep what thou hast received. For all the people that's against the Old Testament, the scripture says, keep what thou hast received, neither adding thereto, nor taking away therefrom. And that's what y'all do. You're taking away from the commandments. Oh, I'm not keeping the dietary law. Oh, I'm not keeping the Sabbath. I'm not doing those commandments. I'm not keeping the feast days. That's not early Christianity. Because the early Christian writings, okay, the true followers that came from the apostles, not everyone, because you did have proponents that went against the commandments, but they were not the true followers coming from the apostles. They deviated the true followers and the true writings tells you to keep the commandments so that was a change Peter it says Peter said brethren the authority is not of one by constraint but as we were commanded by the Lord I pray you that you keep the commandments of God not taking anything from them, nor adding to them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose is the glory forever. Amen. And that's from the Coptic church order. Early Christian literature. Again, telling you and instructing the, the laity to keep the commandments. And this is coming from the piety. Okay. This is coming from the bishop. This is coming from the scribes. And on down. So they taught the commandments. You don't see them saying, oh, the law is done away with. Which is a saying in many churches. Right? You don't see that in here. Nowhere in this text does it propagate that message but the message that you see propagated in early christian writing is the keeping of the commandments we read the didache we read the apostolic the apostolic constitution and now we're reading the coptic church order which was to the church to the christians in egypt and alexandria next slide polycarp you got polycrates right which was a proponent of polycarp Right? It says we exert, and Polycarp is a very inter interesting church father because he was taught by John, one of the apostles. And he had an argument, which Ephanius brought up with Ant Antisetus, about keeping the Passover according to the way the apostles kept it, which is on the 14th of Nisan, on the 14th of Obed, according to the full moon. Like our forefathers have always kept Passover. Now, here's the quote. We observe the exact day. Now, this is Polycrates. We observe the exact day, neither adding nor taking away. For in Asia, also great lights have fallen asleep, meaning a lot of leaders and luminaries had died. This says, which shall rise again on the day of the Lord's coming. All these observe the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel. Wait a minute. Early Christians keeping the Passover. That's rare in modern Christianity because there are proponents of Easter or Ashtar or Astaroth. 
They're not proponents of the Passover, a Passach. But you can see the Polycrates in the Church of Asia, they kept the Passover. They didn't deviate from the scriptures. They didn't deviate from the apostles. They didn't deviate from Christ. A lot of you people call yourself Christians. You are dragging his name through the mud because you're not doing anything he did or anything his followers did. So you see, they, they all these exert the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, deviating in no respect, but following the rule of faith. And I also, Polycrates, the least of you all do according to the tra tradition of my relatives, some of whom I have closely followed. For seven of my relatives were bishops, and I am the eighth, and my relatives always exert a day when the people put away the leaven. So they, they observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They observe Passover. And we know they observe Pentecost because of Acts 2. They observe these things. Source, Eusebius, Church History, Book 5 and 24. So you can clearly see that these early Christians in the 1st and 2nd century AD was keeping the commandments. And then when you read Acts 2, that's after Christ died. The narrative that's been forced down our throats since we, were chi since we were children is that, oh, Christ done away with the commandments. Well, if after Christ died, don't you think the apostles got the memo? If the, if the laws were done away with, why Peter tell um, Cornelius, or during that, during that time when he received that vision after meeting Cornelius, why did he say he have not eaten anything common or unclean? That was way after Christ died. You guys have to think, man. He still was keeping the dietary law. Next slide. So Polycrates and the Church of Asia, they were still keeping Passover. Again, early Christianity, the first Christians are the Nazarenes, the Essenes, the Ebionites. All these people kept the commandments. And a lot of church followers that came later, church fathers that came later, later that were proponents of a different Christianity and deviating from the apostles, and deviating from Christ, they burnt a lot of these ancient writings and threw away a lot of these writings. That's why they only exist in parchments. Only pieces of them exist and fra they're fragmented because you had a lot of people that was pushing paganism and hedonistic teachings and mixing, mixing that with the, the, the Gospels. They didn't want the truth. So we're going to read about these Nazarenes, the early Christians. Because you, you guys forgot, the first Christians were Jews. Even if you push the narrative that Cornelius was an actual Gentile, all the way into Acts 10, those, those are all Jews. Those are all Israelites. So these early Jews, these early Christians... The Nazarenes, let's talk about it. The Nazarenes accept Messiah in such a way that they do not cease to observe the old law. So during the time of St. Jerome, these people still existed and they did not stop keeping the commandments. And the source is Jerome on Isaiah 8 and 14. They always kept the commandments. They never said, oh, Christ gave us the uh, okay to just do away with all these laws and become with, uh, wicked and filthy people. Because the laws give order and instruction in our lives. You do know what you're saying when you say we don't need the laws. That's lawlessness. That's, what, that's why we're in the bottom right now because our people have no order, structure, structure of government to govern their lives. That's why we have baby mama drama. Baby father drama. Murder rate is skyrocketing in our neighborhoods. We tear down the ghetto. Because there's no reciprocity and there's no commandments to keep us in structure. And build us up. You take away the very, what, the very thing that's going to make us a nation. But as you can see, the Nazarenes did not teach that. They taught that they to keep the law and they observed it. Next quotation. They have no different ideas, but confess everything exactly as the law proclaims it. 
end in Jewish fashion, except for their belief in Christ, if you please, for they acknowledge both the resurrection of the dead and the divine creation of all things and declare that God is one and that his son is Jesus Christ. Source, Ephesians of Solomon, Panarion, book 29, chapter 7, line 2. So they, they kept the commandments and believed Christ. And to the right, we, we're going to put black imagery in this presentation because some of y'all have been duped to think that these Christians and these early followers of Christ had to be white men because you let Hollywood guide your perception of the Bible. White supremacy is in your mind and black infidelity is in your mind. White supremacy is telling you that these people had to be white and black infidelity is telling you that these people couldn't be black. But we have the ancient relics frescoes, paintings that say the, say the contrary. You can see Christ is black. His leaders around him are black. The people coming to see him are black. But you can see the Nazarenes, the early Christians, these early followers of Christ, observed the law. And you can see the source material there. Write these sources down. Make notes because people are going to challenge your faith. Be ready to defend yourself. Now here's the change right here. I made mention to it earlier. It says it appears an unworthy, unworthy thing that in the celebration of the most holy feast, we should follow the practice of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. Let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd, for we have received from our Savior a different way. So when people say, oh, Christ changed this and changed that, and we're no longer bound by the law, we're not going to keep the commandments. You're following Constantine. Constantine was pushing that. And you had other Christians before in the second century pushing that, maybe Tertullian. Because when we're going to get to the scripture, Timothy told you that the doctrines of the devils were going to come after the apostles left. Oh, the Savior gave us a different way. What's that different way? Oh, don't keep the commandments. Here, keep Easter. Keep Christmas. All these pagan different pagan ideas. Which breaks the second commandment, by the way. So, the source is Eusebius, Life of Constantine, Volume 3, Chapter 18, Life of Constantine, Book 3. A quote from Constantine and how he felt against these Jewish people. I don't want to have nothing coming. Oh, let's change it. We're not keeping the Passover no more. Let's make it Sunday. And that's where you get Easter from. 1 Timothy 4 and 1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some, some, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's why a lot of people... A lot of the Christians went into these doctrines of devils. A lot of people follow Constantine's Christianity. To this day, you follow, you're following Constantine's Christianity. You're doing Sunday worship. You're not observing Passover. You're not doing Pentecost. You're not keeping the Feast of the Memorial of Trumpets that just passed, right? You're not observing the new moons. The only thing we're not supposed to do is sacrifices on those days. We don't give sacrifices. And even Polycarp said that. Because there's no Levitical priesthood. There's no temple. Next slide. Now, let's deal with these scriptures from Paul. Because a lot of people will act like, oh, Paul was a proponent of not keeping the commandments. But we're going to show he was. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7 says, For God have not called us unto uncleanness. Now, we know in modern Christianity, they don't give a damn about the laws of uncleanness. Okay? Which goes beyond the dietary law, but encompasses the dietary law as well. You eat, you eat pork there, ham, honey ham, and all these different things, bacon. Well, we're not supposed to be eating pork. We're not supposed to be eating shrimp. We're not supposed to be eating lobster. That's uncleanness. Once you eat these things, you're unclean. It says, for God have not called us unto uncleanness. That's in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 7. And the writings of Paul. 1 Corinthians 7 and 19 states, Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. 
So he's propagating the keeping of the commandments of God to the Corinthians. Acts 24 and 14, it says, So worship I thee, the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and prophets. So where are you getting Paul is not telling you not to keep the commandments? You're misunderstanding him. And a lot of it is because the KJV is not a perfect translation. If you read the Ford, it tells you that they had difficulties translating it into English. They tell you that in the Ford because these people are more honest than you think. Israel. It says Acts 26 verse 7, unto which promised our 12 tribes. So his whole mission, the reason why he was put on trial is because he was trying to gather the 12 tribes. So all you people thinking that he was going out to real full-blooded heathens that were not Israel, you're sorely mistaken. Because if you read Acts 26 and 7, it says unto which promised our 12 tribes. And that sums up his whole, his whole mission of evangelism. So when he went to Galatia, he was looking for Israelites. When he went to Ephesus, he was looking for Israelites. When he went to Corinth, he was looking for Israelites. When he went to Rome, he was looking for Israelites. That's why in Roman 8, Roman 8, he said the people that he foreknew. Who's the people that God foreknew? The Israelites. In Romans 11, he answers that. Ephesians 3 and 21 says, Unto him be glory in the church of Jesus throughout ages, world without end. Wait a minute, he just called the people at Ephesus the world without end, which we know only applies to the Israelites in the precept is Isaiah 45 and 17. He calls the Israelites world without end. So when he says in Ephesus world without end, he's, he's making reference to the Israelites there in Ephesus. Next slide. Aliens. It says, and when he had said these things, he kissed them and slept alone, sleep, and his sons buried him. And after that, they carried up his bones to the side of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Nevertheless, as Dan had prophesied unto them that they should forget the law of their God and should be alienated from the land of their inheritance and from the race of Israel and from their kindred, so also it came to pass. This is early Christian literature, and it's called Testament of Dan. So they understood that the northern kingdom and the ten tribes were alienated from Israel. Okay? Alienated from their race. Alienated from their kindred. Meaning they were not recognized as Israelites anymore. So that's why in Ephesians 2 and 12, it says that at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens, aliens, who was alienated the 10 tribes from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Psalm 69 and 8, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. So when you read this in context, this is making reference to those Israelites that lost their nationality, lost their connection to the land of their inheritance, and dispersed, being alienated from their land of inheritance. This is early Christian literature, by the way. It's called the Testament of Dan. So now you, now you know the mystery of the Gentiles Paul was talking about. That's why it's a mystery. Next slide. It says, Become not my children as Sodom, which knew not the angels of the Lord, and perish forever. For I know that you will sin, and you will, shall be delivered into the hands of your enemies, and your land shall be made desolate. What is he making reference to? When the Assyrians came and sacked Samaria. And you shall be scattered unto the four corners of the earth, and ye shall be set at naught in the dispersion as useless water. Unto the Most High shall visit the earth, and he shall come as men, with men eating and drinking. Now this is talking about Christ. So he said, you're going to be dispersing the earth as useless water until Christ comes. It says, in peace, breaking the head of the dragon through water. He shall save Israel in all nations. Why? Because Israel was spread in all nations. It says, God speaking in the person of man, 
Therefore tell ye these things to your children that they disobey him not. For I read in heavenly tablets that in very deed you will disobey him and act ungodly against him, not giving heed to the law of God, but to the commandments of men. Because why? They were paganized. They were like the Ephesians. They were like the Greeks. They were like the Romans. They followed their God. They followed Diana. They followed Zeus. They followed Jupiter. They weren't following the Most High no more because they were alienated. And they grew up in these hedonistic towns, just like a lot of people growing up in America. You follow what everything America teaches you. Whether it be lie or, or whether it be a lie or the truth, you follow it because this is the culture that you grew up in. Same thing back then. If you grew up in the, around Ephesus and Ephesians, you grew up like them. If you grew up around Greeks, you grew up like them. You followed the same commandments and, and traditions they follow. You didn't follow the Most High. So they were alienated. It says, therefore shall you be scattered as Gad and Dan, my brethren, who shall not know their own lands, tribe, and tongue. Meaning these people lost their connection to, to Israel. A general term will call them as Gentiles or nations. They just amalgamated. That's what the New Testament is referring to. That's why Paul said, for our 12 tribes, this promise is made. That's when he summed up his whole evangelistic mission was for the 12 tribes because these people were scattered abroad and amongst these different places living as these different tribes but the lord will gather you together in faith through the hope of his tender mercy for the sake of abraham isaac and jacob and that's what the new testament is about gathering these 10 tribes gathering all of israel together and waking them up out of that dead state and this is early christian literature first and second century a.d testament of asher so Whoever's writing this is understanding the parables and understanding what happened with the ten tribes and how it had to be fulfilled in the New Testament. So, we're proving that early Christianity is completely different from modern Christianity. Again, another source. Behold, my children, I have shown you unto, I shown you the last times that all shall come to pass in Israel. Do, you, do ye also therefore charge your children that they be united to Levi and to Judah? For through Judah shall salvation, salvation arise unto Israel. Because we know Christ came through Judah. And in him shall Jacob be blessed. For through his, through his tribe shall God be seen dwelling among men on the earth to save the race of Israel. And he shall together... He should gather together the righteous from the Gentiles. So he's talking about Christ being sent to the earth and gathering these Israelites. Gathering these Israelites. This is early Christian literature. So again, now you know the mystery of the Gentiles Paul was making reference to. This is Testament of Naphtali. Early Christian literature. Because a lot of you, a lot of you people, all you're going to say is, oh, you're just getting that from one West. You're getting that from one West. The teachings of one West, that the Gentile that Paul is making reference to in regarding salvation and gathering, are Israelites. That's 2,000 years older than one West. So don't give me that. The commandments being in the New Testament and pushed by the apostles, that's 2,000 years older than one West. So don't give me that either. See, we show and prove here on Genesis 49ers. We lose sleep reading these articles in different parchments and documents to bring forth a cohesive argument. All you have is arguments. You have no source or no data to back it up. But here in Genesis 49ers, we say no to vague interpretations and we give thorough breakdowns. We're thoroughly breaking this down for all of the haters of God out there. We have ammunition. We can pull from the archives. Our forefathers wrote this for a reason. It's set in stone. So these doctrines have existed before one West. First and second century AD. Next slide. The Shepherd of Hermes, which I want to talk about it real quick before I get into the quote. This was accepted in churches. He was read in churches and a lot of people attributed him to being Paul and it was accepted in churches, in the early churches. 
See, everything that, that was canonized or rejected is not, it has to be um, looked at again because a lot of people had biases. Like 2 Peter 2 and 3 was heretical. It was deemed as heretical by many early church fathers and proponents of the early Christian church. But guess what? It ended up in King James, the book of Hebrews, Revelations. Why? Because these books, Martin Luther had 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 it in for Revelation, 2 Peter, 1 John 2 and 3, because all them books tell you to keep the commandments of the Most High. He hated everything that had to do with keeping the commandments. So he said, oh, those books are heretical. Same thing in the past. Oh, those books are heretical because these books were plain. And we're going to show you that the Shepherd of Hermes was plain. This is what it states. These 12 mountains are the 12 tribes which inhabit the world. The Son of God was preached to these by the apostles. That one verse is telling you the whole mission of the New Testament. The whole mission of Paul. The whole mission of Peter. The whole mission of Barnabas. Philip. All these people. It was to the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's in the Shepherd of Hermas chapter 17. Early Christian literature. First century Christian literature. And to the right we have black imagery. Abraham raised his sword to his son Isaac. Catacomb of Via Latina. Rome. 320 AD. Early Christian imagery. Early Jewish imagery. And they're all black. Because we can't forget about that. The Jews of antiquity were black. They had dark skin. Next slide. Race. Um, we have the Stromata up top. Clement Alexander it says, Blessed are we, Israel, for what is pleasing to God is known by us. I want you to keep that in mind. Clement Alexander was teaching that they were Israelites. He was Christian and teaching they were Israelites. And he quoted that from Baruch 4 and 4. Now the dialogue with just a matter with Trifo, he says something very interesting to Trifo, the Jew. It says, Ask therefore your whole race from that one Jacob who was surnamed Israel, we're called Jacob and Israel, so we, from Christ who but got us for God, are called in our Jacob, in Israel, in Judah, in Joseph, in David, the true children of God. So he's like basically saying we're Israelites too. Very interesting dialogue. Next slide. Clement. So what I, what I brought those two sources for to show you that the early Christians looked at themselves as Israelites. Blood Israelites. Not no spiritual Israel. They were claiming that they were descendants of Israelites. Now, to the top we have Clement of Alexandria who lived in the 2nd century AD. Then on the bottom we have Clement of Rome who lived in the 1st century AD. The top quotation says, For we are Israelites... Again, Clement of Alexandria. I want you to keep this in mind. He's teaching that to his church, to the piety and to the laity, that they are Israelites who were convinced not by signs, but by hearing. Wherefore it is said, Rejoice, O barren, that thou bear, that bearest not. Break forth and cry that thou didst not travail with child. For more are children of the desolate than of her who hath a husband. So, He's basically telling his congregation, the people that's reading his, his works, that we are the Israelites. The bottom, and that's from Stromata chapter 6, from Clement of Alexandria. The bottom is Clement of Rome. It says, in short, Clement is the most characteristic representative of church continuity. His leading idea is, we Christians are the true Israelites, son of Abraham, and heirs of the promises. Abraham and Jacob, Moses, and David belong to us alone. That, found, that sounds like a very racist statement. He said, this, this, this is our heritage. This is who we are. We're Israelites. And we know Clement of Rome being an early bishop in the first century that Paul made mention to in Philippians 4 and 3. And that's from the first age of Christianity, page 301. So I'm bringing this up to show that there was a primacy with the Israelites. Early Christianity was in the hands of the Israelites. Taught by the Israelites. Taught to the Israelites. The congregation made of the Israelites. Next slide. Again, early Christian literature. This is Clement of Alexandria. The Stromata book, book 6, chapter 5. It says, Then in one word he asks us, Whose is the world and all that is in the world? Are they not God's? 
Wherefore, Peter says that the Lord said to the apostles, if any one of Israel then wishes to repent and by my name to believe in God, his sins shall be forgiven him after 12 years go forth into the world that no one may say we have not heard. Again, Clement is showing you the mission is to the Israelites. The gospel is for the Israelites. That's what it's for. That's what I'm showing you in this early Christian literature. So when you say, oh, one West is, they made this up. And if you teach this, you're one West. You do realize this is 2,000 years older than one West. You do realize it's 2,000 years older than anything known as ISUBK ever existed. And this is from, a, from Peter that doesn't exist to this day. A book of Peter doesn't exist. Why? Because you had Christians hating what they read. Heretical Christians hating what they read. Probably follows a Constantine. And he burnt the parchments and books of these early Christian writings. Next slide. Now we must know that the Clement of Rome, Clement of Rome was of repute. Even though we don't see his writings in modern bibles but it should be because it was reputed as the gospel here's the proof the source right here the epistle of clement recognized by all so the epistle of clement clement of rome what he wrote to the corinthians was recognized by everyone and when you read the uh, first clement right that whole message is to israelites he's going through the history of israelites so if the Corinthians are not Israel, why is he telling them all these in interesting things about David, interesting things about Ruth, in, in, or not Ruth per se, but the story of Ruth, interesting things about Jacob, Joseph, and talking about salvation being procured to Israel? Why is he talking about these things to them? And they have nothing to do with Israel. So again, the epistle of Clement recognized by all, which he wrote in the name of the church at Rome to the Corinthians. So this was recognized by all churches in this time. Why, why is his book and his writings not in the modern Bible? Why is it not in the King James Version? Because you had a group of people that had a problem with anything mentioning Israel and had a problem with anything mentioning the commandments. And the sources used to be his church history, book 3, verse 38. And to the right, we have the quotation of Philipp Philippians 4 and 3. It says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So we see Clement name being mentioned. A lot of people attribute this Clement to being the Clement of Rome. Because he was a bishop in the first century AD. So we see that his writings were reputed. Next slide. I want you to remember, we, we talked about Clement. He taught to his laity, to his church, to his members that we are Israelites. Now, we're going to get some idea on some of these members and people that follow Clement of Alexandria. Here's a quotation. It says, I was privileged to hear and of the blessed and truly extraordinary men. Of those one, the Ionian was in Greece. So we have someone as an Ionian living in Greece, right? A second in South Italy a third Lebanon, a fourth from Egypt, others were in the east, one in Assyrian. So you had somebody from Egypt, somebody that was regarded as an Assyrian, another in Palestine of Hebrew origins. When I met the last who was first in competence by hunting him out of his hunt in Egypt, I found the rest. These men preserved the authentic tradition of the blessed teaching directly from Peter, James, John, and Paul, the Holy Apostles, and that's the source used to be his church history, book five, chapter eight. Wait a minute. He said one of these men that was with him was an Ionian of Greece. One came from Italy. The other came from Lebanon. The other from Egypt. One from Assyria. Who are these people? Let's go back to the quotation. In Clement Stromata, chapter 6, he says, For we are Israelites. All these people he's making reference to that he got that were taught by these apostles, he's telling you in his writings, we are Israelites. We are the Israelites. Those are Israelites. He's making reference to those Israelites. 
They just lived in Assyria, grew up in Assyria, grew up in Ionia, and had those titles. Why? Because Israel was dispersed. They were dispersed and grew up without. They grew up without their customs, their language, and, and, and knowledge to who they were. So they took on these different identities. That's what we read in the early Christian, Christian literature, Testament of Dan, Testament of Asher, and Testament, Testament of Naphtali. That's what we read. That's why he's calling these people Israelites, because they are Israelites just living in foreign lands. So with that, I'm going to conclude the lesson. I'm praying that it was helpful, that you guys got edified through this, that you can clearly see that early Christianity and modern Christianity are two different entities, very opposing ideas. One is teaching the commandments. One is teaching the Sabbath, dietary laws. Modern Christianity isn't. One is teaching a universal salvation, which don't get me wrong. The Bible does employ diplomacy. Even in our old kingdom, we allowed other nations to be around us, but they had to conform to our laws, right? Luke 9, I mean, Leviticus 19, 33 says, don't vex the stranger amongst you. So we didn't treat them any kind of way. We employed diplomacy on many occasions, but you have to understand that we're the stars in this, in this strip that you call the Bible. It's about us. It's about the Israelites. It's an Israelite primacy. That never stopped. But modern Christianity is telling all the Jews are done away with, even though the scriptures tell you he has not done away with the people that he has foreknown. But Christianity will teach that. Modern Christianity, a lot of proponents of modern Christianity teaches that. It doesn't matter. So guess what? The scriptures are still written for his people and by his people. And before I close, to the right, you have Daniel in stained glass, Osprey's Germany. What color is he? Black. What is his race? He's a Jew. For anybody trying to claim that the Jews are not black, oh, you can't say that. We have proof. We have artwork. We have frescoes. We have the earliest images showing them and depicting them as being black. So please don't make that a debate to topic. You will lose. Bad. But again, in closing, we can clearly see that modern Christianity and early Christianity that was taught by the apostles and procured by the apostles are two different things. You don't see Easter. You don't see Christmas. You don't see them saying uh, to hell with the commandments. But you do see them rising up Israel. You do see them keeping the Sabbath. You do see them pushing the, the um, dietary laws, the feast days. And not deviating to deviating what they learned from Christ and the apostles. We read those things. We've seen Polycarp um, defend Passover. Polycrates and the followers in the Church of Asia defend Passover. So we can clearly see there's a difference. I'm going to follow the early Christianity that the apostles taught, not this modern Christianity coming from Constantine and, and other proponents that were contrary to the law, statutes, and commandments, and to the Word of God. Haters of God. Haters of Israel. I'm not going to follow that. And the Israelites are the so-called blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, and many West African groups. Okay? Those who are true Israelites are of Negro and Indian descent. With that, I say shalom. Like the video. Comment below if you agree or disagree. Respectfully. Do it respectfully. Share on the many social media websites such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Let's get this truth out here, family. Genesis 49ers signing off.